The need for all this is based on the simple fact that today the lover's discourse is one of extreme solitude. This discourse is spoken by thousands of subjects. Who really knows? But it's never affirmed. It's completely forsaken by language. It's ignored, disparaged and derided by it, dislocated not only from scholarship but also from the very mechanisms of our thought in the sciences and arts alike. Once a discourse is repressed into the backwaters of the unreal like this, exiled from all light and joy, it has no option but to become the site, however pathetic, of an affirmation. This affirmation is the subject of the text that you will hear here. Everything you hear follows from one principle, that the lover is not to be reduced to a simple subject, but rather that we hear in his or her voice that which is unreal, yet impossible to ignore. In the discourse, we create the fundamental person, the I, in order to render an utterance, but not to offer an analysis. What you will hear then are portraits, but not psychological portraits. Instead, they're structural portraits, each inviting you into the discourse. This is a discourse of a person speaking within themselves, amorously confronting the other, the one who is loved. Throughout any love life, figures occur to the lover in a random order. Each figure explodes, vibrates in and of itself like a sound detached from any melody, repeated like the motif of a hovering music. There's no logic. They spin, crash, disappear, and return with no more order than mosquitoes. But the one who is loved never speaks. It is the lover who speaks.
I'm engulfed. I succumb. It's an outburst of annihilation that affects me either from despair or fulfilment. Sometimes I have a craving to be engulfed. For example, this morning out on the shore, the weather is mild. But I am suffering. The notion of ending it all is always present. But free from resentment, I'm not blackmailing anyone. It's an insipid notion and changes nothing. It only matches the colour, the silence, the desolation of the morning. But another time, we were waiting for the bus. This time from happiness, that same outburst of annihilation swept through me. That's how it happens. Misery or joy engulfs me. I'm dissolved. I fall, I melt, I flow. My thoughts are tested the way you test the water with your foot. There's nothing particularly serious about it. It's just what gentleness is. I know that both senses of engulfment come from a wind. In my mind's eye, we die together from loving each other. It's a moment of hypnosis. I have no responsibility here. The act of dying isn't up to me. I'm just, I'm just aware there's no longer any place for me anywhere. The image of the other in which I was fixated no longer exists. But I have to ask myself, is this abyss anything more than convenience? It's easy to read it as an emotion and not as an escape. But I evade it. I dilute to myself. And when I come out, oh, it's it is ecstasy.
Waiting is the storm of anxiety caused by waiting for the loved being. I'm waiting for an arrival, a return, a, a sign of some sort. In literature, a woman waits for her lover at night in the forest. I'm just waiting for a phone call, but well, the anxiety is the same. I organise it, manipulate it, cut out portions of time in which I act all out as a play. The setting is the interior of a cafe, and I'm the sole actor. We've agreed to meet, and I'm waiting. Well, in the prologue, I'll work out the reason for her delay. I decide to take it badly. Act one begins. It's filled with myself questioning. Like, was there some misunderstanding about the time and place? You know, I try to remember the moment we agreed to meet, but it's... It's not good. Act two is the act of anger. I word aggressive accusations for the other. Ah oh, well, even still you could have... 
<laughs> well, well, you know fine well. If only she were here to hear me. But Act 3, Act 3 is the beginning of pure anxiety. The anxiety of abandonment. I shift from absence to death. She's dead. Boom. An explosion of grief. I am livid. Waiting is enchantment. Yeah, I've received orders not to move. You know, I can't leave the room, not even to go to the toilet. Still, I know the being I'm waiting for isn't real. As a psychologist said, that I create and, and recreate it over and over, starting from my capacity to love, starting from my need for it. If the other doesn't come, it's no problem, I, I hallucinate the other. Waiting is... Wait in its delirium.
This word refers to all kinds of movements and desires. But what's always the same is that the heart is constituted as a gift. A gift, whether it's ignored or rejected. The heart is the organ of desire. It swells and weakens just like the sexual organs. What does the world do? What does the other do with my desire? That's the anxiety that gathers in the heart's problems. The heart's what I imagine I give. Each time this gift is returned to me, I realize that the heart is all that remains of me when everything else is taken away. The heart is what remains to me. And this heart that lies heavy on my heart is heavy with the ebb that fills it with itself. Only lovers and children have hearts, by the way.
I want to understand. I want to understand. I want to understand. Je veux comprendre. Comprendre. This is the state where you suddenly perceive the amorous episode as a knot of so inexplicable. inexplicable reasons and impaired solutions and suddenly exclaim, I want, I want to understand, understand what is happening, what is to, happening me. to me. What do I think of love? Qu'est-ce que je pense de l'amour? En somme, what do I think of love? Je n'en pense rien. What do I think of love? As a matter of fact, fact, I think, I think nothing, nothing at, at all of love. I'd be glad to know what it is, but being inside, I see it in existence, not in essence. What I want to know, love, is the, the very, very substance, substance I, employ I employ in order to, in speak, order to speak the lover's discourse. The lover's discourse. Ce dont je veux connaître est la matière même dont j'use pour parler. Coming out of the cinema alone, mulling over my problem, my lover's problem, 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 which the film has been unable to make me forget, I just explained, I want to understand what's happening to me. I want to understand myself, to make myself understood, to make myself known, be embraced. I want someone to take me with them. Énoncé dans un autre langage que le mien, je veux me représenter à moi-même mon délit. Je veux regarder en face ce qui me divise, me coupe. Je veux me comprendre, faire, me 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 The painful ordeal in which the loved being appears to withdraw from all contact, making no clear reason to anyone else. In texts, in books and films, the fade out of voices is a good thing. The voices of a story come and go, disappear and overlap. We're never really sure who's speaking. It's the text that speaks, that's all. No more image, nothing but language. But the other isn't a text. The other is an image, single and coalescent. The other's fade out makes me anxious. It happens without cause and without conclusion. It's like a kind of melancholy mirage as she withdraws into infinity and I wear myself out trying to get there. Jealousy causes less suffering for me because at least she is still vivid and alive. But in the fade out, the other seems to lose all desire. I'm abandoned by the other, but this abandonment is intensified by the abandonment the other herself suffers. She is washed out, liquidated. I can no longer sustain myself on anything, even the desire the other might get elsewhere. I'm only in mourning for an object that itself is in mourning, suggesting perhaps how much we need the other's desire, even if this desire is not addressed to us. Her voice lives in the fade out. The voice supports and performs the disappearance, just as the voice dies. What makes the voice is what cuts me, in that it has to die, and can never be anything but a memory, a memory that lives inside my head, well beyond the ears. It's a tenuous but monumental voice, one of those things that can only exist once it's disappeared.
Lightest amorous emotion, whether it's happiness or disappointment, brings some folk to tears. I weep often, very often, and in floods. But I never know. Is it the lover who cries or the romantic? Is it a characteristic of my type, this tendency to dissolve in tears? by releasing my tears without constraint. It's, it's like I follow the orders of another body, a body of liquid expansion to weep together and flow together. Where does the lover get the right to cry if it isn't in a reversal of values in which the body is the first target. Perhaps the right is granted when the lover accepts the rediscovering themselves as a child. Who will write the history of tears? Which societies, which periods have wept the most? Since when was it that men, but not women, no longer cried? When did sensibility become recognised as sentimentality? The images of virility are always changing. The Greeks and 17th century audiences apparently wet buckets at the theatre. But perhaps weeping is too crude. Perhaps we can't refer to all tears with the same name. Perhaps Within the same lover, there are several persons who engage with different but similar forms of weeping. If I have so many ways of weeping, it's probably because when I weep, I always address myself to someone. The recipient of my tears isn't always the same. I adapt my ways of weeping to the kind of blackmail which, by my tears, I want to make use of. Sometimes, when I weep, I want to impress someone, bring pressure to bear on them. Look at what you've done to me. In my tears, I tell a story. I create a myth 
of grief and after that, adapt myself to it. And I can live with it. Because when I weep, I produce the truest of messages. That of my body, not that of my words. Words, what are they? One tear says more than any of them.
It's a happy and or tormenting remembrance of an object, a gesture, or a scene linked to the loved being and marked by the intrusion of the imperfect tense into the grammar of the lover's discourse. It's a brilliant summer and I often sit up the park and share a few cans with her tell my story and speak in the present tense, but even as I tell it, I know the scene is already a remembrance. I know that one day I'll recall the scene and lose myself in the past. It's a fragrance without support, a texture of a memory, something like pure expenditure, something only like the Japanese haiku is able to articulate never recovering it for any destiny. The imperfect is the tense of fascination. It seems alive, but yet it doesn't move. Imperfect presence equals imperfect death. It's neither oblivion nor resurrection. It's just the exhausting lure of memory. From the start, the scenes start to play a role, take their place in my memory. I see it and know it. The very moment the scenes are forming, they come together like a theatre of time. The stars were shining. Happiness will never return just this way. And knowing that both fulfills and cuts me.
Realising that the difficulties of the amorous relationship originate in the ceaseless desire to appropriate the loved one in one way or another, I resolve to give up all of the will to possess. The lover's constant thought is the other owes me the thing I need. But on appreciating this for the first time, I become really afraid. I throw myself on my bed, mull over the situation and decide from now on I won't make any attempt to possess him. It's a reversed substitute for suicide. Not to kill oneself for love is to make this decision, not to possess another. The will to possess needs to stop, but the non-will to possess can't be seen. No oblations. The non-will to possess isn't a kindness. It's intense and dry. On the one hand, I don't oppose the sensorial world. I let desire circulate within me. On the other, I hold it up against my truth. My truth is to love absolutely. Otherwise, I withdraw, scattering myself like an army deserting or abandoning a siege. You see, the aim is not to try to possess the non-will to possess. It's to let come from the other just what comes, to let past what goes, to possess nothing, to repel nothing, to receive, not to keep, to produce without taking. I love you is in my head, but I keep it off my tongue. I don't say anything. I speak silently to who is no longer or who is not yet the other. I keep myself from loving you. <laughs> <laughs> 